My name is Farah Kiladar. I'm the CEO of the World Affairs Council. Welcome to our event tonight. I've uh, been sitting in the back for part of the movie and I could see that people were really enjoying it, uh, as was expected. As you all already obviously know, we've got Maziar Bahari with us. Uh, he literally just arrived a couple of hours ago from London to be with us tonight. And I'd just like to say a few things about Maziar, uh, all of which, some of which you already know, some maybe not. And then uh, we'll start a conversation, uh, followed by questions from you that you can write on the cards. Maziar, as we all know, is an, an Iranian-Canadian journalist. Uh, he's a filmmaker and a human rights activist. Um, he was born in Tehran and left Iran in 1988, moved to Canada, and then was a Newsweek reporter from 98 to 2011. He uh, made his first film based, it's an inter interesting fact, it was based on the voyage of the Saint Louis. He was in fact the first Muslim to make a film about the Holocaust. And, and the last one maybe. And the last one probably. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, um, Ahmadinejad was in it as well. Um, it, basically talked about the story of 937 German uh, Jews that escaped Germany, tried to get to the US, uh, Canada, as well as Cuba, but they were prevented from entry and had to go back to Nazi Germany. Uh, Maziar has made several films and documentaries for the BBC as well as uh, Channel 4. And his films have won several awards, including an Emmy in 2005. And then his memoir, Th Then They Came For Me, on which the movie you just watched is, was based, was a New York Times bestseller. After his release, uh, Maziar was tried in absentia in Iran and by the Revolutionary Court and sentenced to 13 years imprisonment and 74 lashes should make those 13 years a little bit more interesting. 13 and a half years. 13 and a half, yeah. okay, absolutely. Um, welcome. Well, thank really you. Wonderful Very to nice have to you. be here. And thanks everyone for coming. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'd like to start really by um, finding out a little bit more about you. Uh, we see in the movie you uh, imagining conversations with your father mostly, who was arrested in the 50s, if I'm not mistaken, by the Shah for being a communist, uh, as well as your sister. We have one clip towards the end. And she had been arrested by um, Khomeini, Khomeini, not Khamenei, Khomeini, uh, in the 80s for being a communist as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about that background? Well, I think the background of my family is not uncommon in Iran. There are many thousands of Iranian families like my family who have struggled for a more accountable, more transparent government, at least since 1905 when Iran had the constitutional revolution and established the first parliament in Asia. So, as you said, my father joined the Communist Party in the 1940s. He grew up in the occupied Iran. Iran was occupied by the Russians, the British, and the Americans, uh, the allied forces that divided Iran into three zones of um, influence. And my father's city, Hamadan, was in the part that the British controlled. So, his his childhood memories was of uh, foreign troops in the country. And in the 1940s, as in many places, including in this country, uh, communism was the way to resist uh, foreign occupation and many nationalist movements and communist movements that were um, somehow entangled. So he joined the Communist Party. and. He fought for independence of Iran and for democracy and freedom. And of course, I never agreed with communism and I criticize it. But when you look at it in that context, you, are, you can understand why he joined it. The same thing happened after the revolution in 1979 when uh, Ayatollah, Khomeini basically, Ayatollah Khomeini's government basically hijacked people's revolution 
and brought another dictatorship in power. People toppled Shah's uh, somehow benign dictatorship in a way, and they brought uh, Ayatollah Khomeini's really brutal and vicious uh, dictatorship to power, and my sister fought for, uh, for freedom and democracy and, account and, a, and an accountable government again through uh, the Communist Party and many thousands of people were jailed after the revolution, thousands of people were executed, tortured in the same prison that I was in. I grew up in, uh, in an Iran which witnessed a revolution in 1979 and then it, we, uh, we had a war with Iraq for eight years from 1980 to 1988. So I always uh, was fascinated with uh, politics, but I never wanted to be part, you know, be part of a political party because I grew up in an era that people were somehow disenchanted and they were uh, disappointed in different ideologies and different ideals in general, ideologies and religions. So. I, I'm part of a generation that somehow rejects the ideals of our uh, parents. So I thought the best way I can help people is through journalism and being a neutral journalist. So, and you know, the government did so not that accept you. that. <laughs> you know, the government couldn't tolerate that either. So. And it's interesting you say that because one of uh, your comments uh, in your interview, that your 60 Minutes, which was soon after you were released, you said that they are more scared of the silent resistors as opposed to the violent ones. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, uh, again, this is, a, this is an international phenomenon, as Martin Luther King said in this country, that you have to speak in a different language from your enemy. The Iranian government is an armed, brutal, vicious government. So if you want to fight this government with brutality, with viciousness, and have an armed struggle, the government is always stronger than you, can defeat you. But if the resistance is nonviolent, if it's peaceful, if it's through uh, sharing information, uh, informing the public, then they don't know what to do with it. And part of uh, my interrogation was about the things that I did that they couldn't understand. They were saying that you said uh, uh, this and that in your article, you made this film. We don't understand what you exactly did, but we know that it's dangerous because we don't understand it. And I think uh, for the government of Iran, uh, I think we can easily say that the government of Iran is an analog 20th century government that is, it is very much like the Soviet Union, that is, uh, these governments, they can easily shut down newspapers, interfere with short, shortwave radio uh, transmission, but when it comes to digital information, when it comes to satellite channels, when it comes to the internet, social networks, they don't know what to do. And what we witnessed in 2009 was that, for the first time, people uh, use social networks in a social movement, not only to disseminate information, share information, but also to mobilize themselves. Something that was somehow emulated in other countries like uh, in Brazil, in Hong Kong, in Arab countries, in Ukraine, and also in this country, in Ferguson, Missouri, that people uh, shared information and mobilized their actions through social media, mainly Facebook and Twitter. Right. Unfortunately, Google Plus was not around, so no. <laughs> otherwise I think that would be victorious, yeah. And I have to ask about your mother. Um, I can't, be being a mother myself, I can't begin to think what it's like to lose your husband uh, to a regime and then to lose your daughter shortly after being released from imprisonment. Am I, was she no, released or was it in, States. yeah. And then to go through this with you. Uh, how is she doing? Is she still in Iran? Can you just tell She's us? Okay. Yeah. She's all right. Yeah, yeah, is she yeah. still in Iran? Yes, yeah. Okay, okay. And uh, again, my mother is a 
part of a generation of Iranian mothers who don't want to leave Iran and they don't want to, uh, they, they think it's their country and the people who should leave the country are the people in the government right. who have nothing, uh, no business running the government. So whenever you talk to people like my mother or many other people who've been through prison or through tragedies and they ask them, why don't you leave Iran? They say, why should we leave? These are the people who should go into exile, like many dictators uh, before them, like Ben Ali in Tunisia, who's gone to Saudi Arabia, um, Idi Amin <coughs> from Uganda, who also went to Saudi Arabia. I don't know. Maybe, I don't think Saudi Arabia accepts these people from Iran, right. but they will find no, a place. Maybe I, to I Russia, so. maybe they can go to <laughs> Russia. <Yeah. laughs> So this, is, this was 2009, uh, and it's Ahmadinejad days. He stayed in power after that. How is it different, if at all, now with the current regime, with President Rouhani? Well, Rouhani is an improvement compared to Ahmadinejad. It doesn't say much, but he is an improvement. It is like when they ask me, uh, how was the food in prison, I say, it's much better than most airline foods. It doesn't say much, but it was an improvement. Uh, I think uh, Rouhani is a pragmatist uh, politician. He is someone who wants to reach a deal with the international community. He wants to give certain freedom and liberties to people in Iran, not because of the goodness of his heart, not because he's a Democrat, but because he thinks that it's good for business, that it's good for business for Iran not to be a pariah, pariah state. It's good for business if people have certain level of freedom uh, to express themselves. So, uh, but Rouhani, as the president of Iran, he is like a prime minister in an absolute monarchy. He has a very limited power. The real power is with Ayatollah Khamenei, who is the supreme leader of Iran. So when you talk to the Iranian nuclear negotiators and when you talk to the, the ones who negotiated even in early 2000s, mm -hmm. uh, in 2001, 2002, uh, you always hear that they had to report on a maybe hourly basis to Ayatollah Khamenei and to his office in order to know what to negotiate about, what to say. And right now, I was talking to a European diplomat last week and he was saying that sometimes we reach a deal with the Iranians, but then they go to another office, they have a conversation with Tehran and they come back and they say that we cannot uh, make that compromise. So uh, Rouhani has that kind of struggle, inner struggle with uh, Khamenei. But overall, I can say that the situation in Iran is improving. It's, uh, the Iran is reforming in a very slow manner. And it's excruciatingly slow, but I think that is a good reform and good change because people look at the neighborhood, people look at Afghanistan, at Iraq, at Libya, at Syria, and those are not good role models. I mean, um, maybe some people in Texas don't agree with me, but uh, I mean, no one wants to live in a country like Libya now. Iran is a country there right now where you can travel anywhere you want, with almost no danger, you can go to any border. And you cannot do that in any other country in the region. That is very true. And I, you know, the supreme leader has always, since the revolution, been really the ultimate power, be it Khomeini or Khamenei. But you do see a shift. So recently with the uh, uh, open letter that was released by the GOP uh, Republican senators, uh, warning that to the, warning the Iranian government that any agreement reached with this administration uh, might not be valid uh, with the new president and could be changed or nullified with a signature. 
Khamenei came back to them with a comment that, you know, this is a reflection of a disintegration within the government in the US, which is quite interesting coming mm -hmm. from Khamenei. But yet he continued to support the nuclear talks. Yeah, well, he has to support nuclear talks because uh, he, ha he wants to survive. He wants to remain in power. And for the Iranian government, after 35 years of being in power, nothing is more important than remaining in power. They do not respect any ideology, any religion. I mean, it, when you talk about Islamic Republic of Iran, to start with, it's an oxymoron because a republic cannot be an Islamic. But this government in Iran, it's not Islamic nor uh, a republic. they just a group of people who want to remain in power. And in 2005, when Ahmadinejad came to power and they were selling oil at the price of $145 a barrel, they could be bombastic. They could, be, they could afford to be arrogant and uh, not negotiate with the world about Iran's nuclear program. Right now, at $45 a barrel, or and even less, they cannot afford that anymore. And for Khamenei, the main priority is to be in power. And for Khamenei, the main priority is not uh, protecting their Muslim brethren in Palestine or uh, Iraq or anywhere. It is to keep the Islamic Republic intact. Even uh, Khomeini said that in the 1980s that Nothing is more important than keeping the Islamic Republic intact. That means that praying, fasting, going to pilgrimage, none of those are as important as keeping the system alive. And taking that, what is your view on what's going on in the region and Iran's involvement in Iraq and Syria uh, right now with the, the Iraqi militias trying to take back the well, north? I yeah, I think Iranian government is doing the, something that many governments around the world are doing, that they're trying to fight their enemies, they're trying to fight their opponents away from their borders. And that is, I think, something very logical when you think about it, that they try to have this uh, war with Israel, not in Iran, but in Lebanon or Syria. They try to keep the Americans busy in Syria, in Lebanon, in Iraq. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and now with the advent of ISIS, the Islamic State, they try to cooperate with the Americans to a certain degree in order to contain Islamic State and keep it away from its borders. So I think even if the Shah's government was in power, any other government uh, would be in power in Iran, they would have that kind of approach to, uh, to, uh, to the region. And Israelis, um, they, and Ben Gurion had, a, had the theory of periphery states, that you have to have a peace with the periphery states in order to uh, sustain your government. So Iranians are doing the same thing as well. Right. And we were just talking on the way here and you said that you actually agreed with Thomas Friedman's view on the recent elections in Israel and the fact that having Netanyahu in the government has been beneficial to uh, uh, the Iranian regime. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I think uh, for the Iranian government, the I mean, we can go back to 2005 when Ahmadinejad came to power and he was God's gift to the Israelis because the Israelis are saying now that Rouhani is a uh, wolf in sheep's uh, clothes and they're saying that Ahmadinejad showed the real face of Iran. And for the Iranians, it is the same thing that they are saying, and not only Iranians, many radicals around the world are saying that uh, Israel is a monolith, that there is no real difference between uh, Zippy Livni and Herzog and Netanyahu, and the fact that people uh, voted uh, for Netanyahu because of his racist comments before uh, the night before the election, and because of his warmongering, 
shows the real identity of the real character of the Israelis. So I think uh, Netanyahu, through his warmongering, through uh, and his supporters as well, through uh, that kind of radical approach to Iran and looking at Iran as a monolith, they are basically helping someone like Khamenei, right. who just wants to have that kind of image of Iran be portrayed in the West and. Netanyahu, in a way, he is the perfect uh, enemy, perfect uh, symbol of Israel for Khamenei and many radicals in the Middle East. Right, right. It's almost like saying uh, actions that have taken place in the Middle East by the West have only encouraged the the theory of you know the ISIS recruitment and Al Qaeda recruitment because it only reinforces what they're saying. So exactly. Lines, so those yes. lines. I have to ask before I move on to the Q&A, uh, at the end of the movie, uh, with you, co well, supposedly you coming out of prison, you see a group of parents just waiting, <coughs> including your mother. Uh, are, do people wait outside the prison in the hope of seeing their family come out, or is it, I mean, Yeah, sometimes, uh, every day, because uh, the Iranian government is quite uh, erratic in a way that sometimes they just release a group of people, sometimes the supreme leader just uh, allows a group of people for whatever reason. For example, we have the New Year, uh, Persian New Year tomorrow mm -hmm. for that reason to uh, for certain group of people to be released. And in 2009, when I was arrested and released uh, four months later, many people, thousands of people were arrested based on the same uh, arrest warrant that I was arrested with. Basically, they arrested me with a Xerox copy of an original arrest warrant that was used for more than 1,000 people, uh, signed by the same person. And as a result, uh, there were hundreds of worried parents and sisters and brothers and wives and husbands and children who were waiting outside. Of course, that reminds me of, uh, I think it was uh, 2003 before the war when Saddam released all the prisoners uh, around all the prisons and, uh, in Iraq, a similar idea. Moving on to the Q&A, and I see that we've got a, quite a few of them. I'll start with uh, a student question. Have you ever contacted any of the specialists since leaving Iran, and what do you know of your driver? Uh, I haven't contacted my specialist, but he has contacted me. Not him, but his boss for the first uh, few months after I came out, and because the night before I left Iran, my specialist, Rosewater, and his boss, who, the, uh, Hajaga, who is portrayed by Nasser, uh, they took me to a cafe, and their last warning was that if you ever talk about what happened in prison, wherever you are in the world, we can always bring you back in a bag. And of course, as soon as I got on the plane, I started to write the Newsweek article. <laughs> and actually, there, was, uh, there is another funny story in that, that uh, when we went to the cafe, uh, Rosewater ordered coffee and um, no, no, cake and tea. And the waiter said that for tea, you have to wait for about 10, 15 minutes because we're just boiling the water. He just looked at the waiter and he said, I want my tea now. And the poor waiter, I don't know what, <laughs> what happened. He said, yes, sir, yes, sir. And he got the hot water within like two minutes or so. so. And then, yeah, he threatened that uh, he's going to bring me back in a bag. And then as, after I started to talk about uh, what happened in prison, in interviews and articles, they harassed my family, they called my mother, they called my brother-in-law, my cousins, and again, I didn't say anything for about two or three months because I thought maybe if I say anything, it's going to worsen the situation, but after three months, I thought, you know, enough is enough, and I went on television and I 
talk to different outlets saying that they are harassing my family. And after that, it stopped, actually. They haven't contacted uh, my family yet. Dawood, the driver, the Dawood in the film is actually a combination of two different characters. And the real Dawood, who was a cabbie, motorcycle cabbie, he's outside of Iran now, and he's got his refugee status. Okay, yeah. excellent. Um, how might a moderate Iranian describe Iran's nuclear armament? Is it justified from a security perspective? Is it justified from an energy perspective uh, or an economic perspective? Well, armaments, uh, the government of Iran says that they don't want to build a nuclear arm and I don't think that they want to really build a nuclear weapon. They want to have the capability to build a nuclear weapon because I think you have to understand that, as I said, this government, its survival is the most important issue for them. They might be genocidal, they might want to kill, they may kill a lot of people in order to stay in power, but they are not suicidal. And they know that if they ever develop the nuclear program and if they ever attack Israel, Israel has not only 250 nuclear warheads, which they, of course, deny to have, but they also have posthumous ability with the help of Germans to attack any country that attacked them. So they know that even if they destroy Israel, Israel can have the, has the ability to destroy them. So they're not going to uh, build a nuclear weapon, but I believe that they may want to have the uh, ability to uh, have the nuclear weapon, like many other countries like Japan, for example, or South Africa or Argentina. But nuclear uh, technology and nuclear uh, reactors in Iran is not something that uh, was, um, was started after 1979 Islamic Revolution. Uh, it was actually the American government that gave the nuclear technology to Iran uh, in 1958 during Eisenhower uh, presidency, uh, during the Atoms for Peace uh, program. And then it was developed further by the Germans and the French and the Russians in the 1970s. And actually, when the Islamic government came to power, they abandoned the nuclear program because they said that it's a waste of money. We have so much oil. Why do we have to waste our money on the nuclear program? And then after the, during the Iraq war, they restarted the program with the help of the Pakistanis and North Koreans. If you went back to that pivotal moment when you were about to post the footage uh, of the riots, but this time you know exactly what was going to happen, would you go through it again? Well, you know, that was the question. When we were touring with John Stewart, that was a question that was asked several times, and he was always just smiling and saying that actually that was not true. It was for the dramatic uh, effect that that uh, scene was created. I personally never had a doubt. I never had a doubt whether I should raise my camera or not. I actually, the full footage is on online, and actually, New York Times published it a few months ago. That I went to the scene with the camera, and I, those uh, scenes with me on the rooftop with the satellite dishes, me saying that I don't have battery and stuff, those are all for dramatic reasons. I never had any qualms about filming uh, people. So, no, I would do the same thing because I was basically a victim of a scenario, uh, something, a plot that they wanted to incriminate certain people within the Iranian government, certain reformists within the Iranian government through people like me who we're working with uh, foreign media, foreign organizations, foreign embassies. They arrested someone who worked with George Soros's uh, Open Society Institute as the NGO conduit. 
They arrested another person uh, who worked with the British Embassy as the diplomatic conduit, and I was supposed to be the media spy. So they had a plan for us already. Uh, whatever I would do, whatever I wouldn't do, uh, I would end up uh, in the same situation. And in fact, I recall you telling John Stewart that you know him apologizing for having caused all of this. Um, you said that even if it was uh, Sesame Street and Elmo, they would have found a, a they reason. They would accuse Elmo of sedition. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which you know, Elmo is a bit of a seditious character. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me, if you're a mother of a two-year-old, Elmo is. To what extent, if any, do you think the Iranian government's paranoia? Uh, is a reaction to the vehement anti-Iranian, anti-Shia rhetoric coming out of Saudi Arabia and Qatar? Uh, to a great degree, of course. I mean, Iranian paranoia is not something new. The country of Iran, Persia, has been at the crossroads of civilizations. It's a country that was attacked by Alexander the Great, Greek Empire in uh, 2,500 years ago. Then the Arabs invaded Iran. Then the Mughals invaded Iran. Then the Allied forces, the Russians and the British and the Americans, they were all running the country one way or another. So Iranians are generally, we can say that they are, uh, paranoia is part of the Iranian psyche and some people are even, I mean, they're just uh, xenophobic because of that history. But this government, uh, it really um, intensified that xenophobia in the beginning of the revolution through insisting on Shia identity of Iran and the Persian identity of Iran, which is threatening to authoritarian regimes in the region, including Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain, Kuwait, uh, Egypt, uh, Yemen. So these governments are all, yeah, Jordan, they're, they're all afraid of this Persia Shia identity or what uh, King Abdullah of Jordan said, uh, the Shia, crescent. The crea creation of Shia crescent by the Iranian government, which means uh, Iran, Syria, and Iraq. So I think that paranoia is, um, was there, it was somehow justified, but they were, the Iranian government is also responsible for intensifying that paranoia. The other part of the paranoia has to do with the presence of foreign troops around uh, Iran, especially American troops. I was talking to an intelligence officer in Iran during the, uh, at the height of the Iraq war in 2005, six, and he said, well, our paranoia is understandable. Wouldn't the Americans be paranoid if Iranians had 300,000 troops in Canada and Mexico? It is uh, something that I think, if you look at the context, it is somehow understandable. Of course, the actions of the Iranian government is not justifiable, but you can understand what, where they're coming from. But we always have to say that they are responsible. Khomeini, especially in the beginning of the revolution, was responsible for much of the animosity that exists against Iran. The uh, occupation of the American embassy in Iran is a really a dark chapter in Iranian history because it was unnecessary. They occupied another country's uh, land. The American government wanted to work with the Iranian uh, government in the beginning of the revolution. The rhetoric that Khomeini used against uh, the governments of Saudi Arabia and Iraq was not necessary. And that was somehow responsible for the start of the war with Iraq as well. Well, Saddam wasn't an angel either, so. No, Saddam was not an angel, and the Shah of Iran understood that Saddam was not an angel, and that's why he forced Saddam to sign an agreement, peace agreement, in 1975. Right. And Saddam 
the first thing he did after the start of the war, he just tore up that uh, peace agreement, Algier peace agreement on television, live television. <coughs> So then what would you say is Iran's ultimate intention vis-a-vis -vis Israel? Do they really want to uh, defeat Israel in a war? No, I think uh, the main issue here is regional dominance in a way. I think uh, three or four countries, if we include Turkey, Turkey, are fighting for regional dominance in the Middle East. Israel, of course, does not want any of the countries in the region to be stronger military, militarily than Israel, and they don't want any country to be even close to uh, be as strong as Israel uh, militarily. And they see, um, rightly, they rightly see Hezbollah as an extension of the Iranian power in uh, Lebanon. They are afraid of uh, Iran's alliance with Bashar al-Assad, and at the same time, they're afraid of uh, ISIS. For Saudi Arabia, regional dominance is very important. They don't like to see a very strong Iran because a very strong Iran means a very strong Shia presence in Shia power in Yemen, which is uh, right uh, the neighbor of Saudi Arabia, and also Saudi Arabia has a very large uh, disenfranchised uh, Shia population. Where and most of the oil is, actually. Where the most of the oil yeah. is, and also uh, the proxy government of Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, which is a minority government, uh, Bahrain has majority Shia population, who are also disenfranchised. And Iran, of course, they have this Shia Persian uh, aspirations as well that uh, since 35 years ago, uh, they want to create this, their own image of uh, Persian empire with a, a Shia identity in the region. Has, how has this movie made a difference to um, giving more voice to journalists, such as um, the Iranian-American journalist that is cu currently uh, imprisoned? Uh, is it Tasun Rezai? Is that Jason. Jason Rezai. Jason Rezai. Do you personally know him? Have you advocated for him? Well, uh, I think when you look at the American media or any other uh, country's coverage of Iran, before this film and during this film and after that film, you see a shift uh, that uh, before the film, it was mostly about uh, the nuclear program. But when we were uh, publicizing the film, before uh, the film came out, during the campaign, uh, we went on different shows and we talked about the human rights situation in Iran from a relatively rational perspective. And that gave us, uh, John Stewart and myself, a platform to talk about uh, these issues. And I think uh, all of these actions, of course, after the film um, you know, vanished from the screens, they, all, they talk about the uh, nuclear program again. But I think these actions, they have to be consistent. These kind of films have to be uh, produced on a regular basis, not only about Iran, because journalists are uh, oppressed, uh, repressed in many other countries, uh, in <coughs> Russia, in China, in Eritrea, Turkey, and in many countries, they are not repressed because there is no, there are no journalists. I mean, when you compare the number of journalists who are in prison in Saudi Arabia and Iran, Iran has more journalists in prison because Iran has journalists. Right. In Saudi Arabia, they don't have any journalists to start with. <laughs> or in North Korea, there are no journalists in prison because they're all dead. So <laughs> it's a different situation. So I think the film gave uh, myself and my colleagues an opportunity to talk about these issues. and. We have a campaign called Journalism is Not a Crime, which is going to be an international campaign. The website is journalismisnotacrime.com, 
and we uh, document every uh, arrest in, in Iran and other countries, and we give the journalists a voice to uh, share the news of what is going on in the country, whether it's China, Russia, Turkey, Iran. This is the last question, uh, as I notice we're getting close to the time. Um, one of the interviews you had, I can't recall which one, you uh, said that solitary confinement is definitely torture. Can you elaborate on that and what would you say vis-a-vis uh, -vis the discussion that goes on, that has gone on in the U.S. since the Iraq war as to whether, you know, uh, water boarding is torture or not and so on? I think solitary confinement not, is not only a torture, but the worst kind of psychological torture. Because you are denying someone of all his or her senses. You cannot see anything except for the walls around you. You cannot touch anything except for the walls around you. Your sense of smell uh, goes numb. It's just that... Uh, you become paranoid because it's, you think that you're in a coffin, basically, that you are in a cube. And depending on the size of the solitary confinement, whether it has a window or not, what you see outside of the window. I was moved from cell to cell in some of the cells that I was in for sometimes two weeks, sometimes three weeks. It was just unbearable. You uh, start uh, hallucinating <coughs> even when you are awake. And as a result, you become more vulnerable. And the torturers, they know that. They know that they can manipulate you through uh, this uh, kind of isolation and solitary confinement. No, I think it's a form of torture. And it and has yes, to be. Prevalent, it has to be condemned wherever it is. And also, I think uh, America. A lot of people, even though they may uh, disagree with the foreign policies of the United States or whatever the Congress does or does not, they still believe in America as the beacon of freedom and democracy. And I think whenever America does something wrong, it gives a reason to oppressors all around the world to justify their actions. Right. right. Just to say, there were a few invites for drinks, and you know, asking for your number as well. So you know, I might pass that or those on later. But it's wonderful having you. Thank well, you great. very much. Thank you very much. Thanks and very much for coming. Thank you for joining thank you. us. Thank you. Thank you.